good morning to all of you. I thank uh, Surajit uh, for this uh, opportunity and this invitation to deliver this talk on uh, where is our uh, specialty going. And if you want to analyze any growth or any movement, I think you need to analyze it on two counts. One is direction and the second is speed. And these are the two important things and you could add a third dimension to it, what is, is the cost of travel and the impact you make when you travel. I think, the rest, I think these are the three things that we need to see. And uh, after getting this uh, uh, topic and the invitation, I asked uh, quite a few plastic students, are you happy with the way we, our specialty is going? And to my surprise, all of them said yes. So when somebody says yes, I don't stop with that. I asked him, now what makes you happy? He said a number of people are doing microsurgery and our youngsters are going on for a lot of things in aesthetic surgery and in the social media and in the WhatsApp groups and all this, our presence is much felt. So I think they are all, they said they are all happy. But there are some fellows who are perennially satisfied to remain unsatisfied. And as far as progress is concerned, I think that's a good thing to have. And I want such fellow. And because people understand, we need to assess ourselves, uh, not by what we are doing, but we should assess ourselves by what we are capable of doing. And in fact, the best way to assess ourselves is to be by what we ought to be doing. I'm a great fan of the Tatas. And 150 years ago, Jamshedji Tata said, when he wanted to rebuild India and wanted to create the Indian Institute of Science, they asked him why he should be. I said, I want to do this for, for India, which he could be. I think that's a very, very nice. So similarly, I think we also have to think the plastic surgery specialty where it ought to be. So that's the way now we should be doing. But then if you have such an idea, what would happen is, then we might have to change the goalpost because the destination itself may change. So when the destination changes, then the whole thing changes. That's one. The second aspect I told was speed. So that again is very important. Suppose if I had to come to Lucknow and start, I can't be traveling at 100 kilometers per hour. I may not reach it at the time when you ought to reach. Suppose you don't embrace change, uh, then you may not be remaining current at that time. See, these are the two things which we had to think, direction and uh, speed. So if we had to have a direction, the first question that we ask ourselves is, why do we exist as a specialty? Suppose I myself put this point, if we have, why do we exist? We to provide plastic reconstructive and aesthetic surgery services to all who need it at the time they need it at a cost they can afford. I think this is a very noble, uh, this thing is a very idealistic side, uh, type of uh, things that we have. But then how successful are we to do this? And then if you need to assess it on three counts, one is the need in the community and what is the availability of uh, the services and uh, how much the available services are utilized. I think that's, uh, these are three things you know, on which we need to assess ourselves. So that means that only will give us as to how the specialty is going. See, India is a country of uh, 1.31 billion. And if you take our uh, association strength and also include those plastic surgeons who are not members, perhaps you take, just take for the, uh, for the argument's sake that we have got you know, 2,000 plastic surgeons in the country. That means you now we have one plastic surgeon for 6.5 million people. That if you take a population of Bangalore is 1.25 billion, that means you need only two, you have got only two plastic surgeons for uh, Bangalore. So there isn't so, but then the spread is different. I think this was concentrated. But nevertheless, we have to say that we have got, in India, we have got one plastic surgeon for 6.5 million people. That means every plastic surgeon must be terribly busy. Even he mustn't even have time to, for anything for the family. But then honestly, if you see, I also ask the same question to many of the plastic surgeons. How busy you are, how much do you think you can expand your services, how many more operations can you do? The minimum they said they could do 40 percent more. Some of them told me they could do 100 percent more. I think that, that's what no, they said, their capacity, they said 100 percent more they could do. So minimum they said no, they could do 40, 40 percent more. Then the question is, no, why are we not doing that 40 percent? How are we doing that? And you take up a lot of units. I took a lot of uh, major uh, plastic surgical units. And what is the output of the plastic surgical uh, units? You will find that always in any theory you will find the, the U graph. And most of the plastic surgical units which have got MCH and which do, they fall between 1,500 to 3,500. 3, I think most of them, I think you know, all, almost all of them fall between the area of uh, 1,500 to 2,500. And I found also two outliers. 
one in the public sector and the private sector who go on to 12,000. Uh, 12,000 surgeries uh, uh, per year. But then they are outliers. I think they work on a, a very different uh, model. So the gap between need and availability utilization, you will find there is a big yawning gap. So whenever there is a yawning gap in any specialties, growth, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not a sign to be proud about, it's a sign to be, to be worried about. So when you don't take the efforts to fill the gap, you need to understand that your existence and growth will be threatened. A lot of people feel that if you've got a tremendous demand that you'll be, you'll be growing, but in fact that's not the thing. Somebody else will find an alternate, alternate pathway. I do not know who said this, but then I got it in my book, which I always used to feel as far as when you take decisions in a hospital. When there is a need, and if you don't grab it, somebody else will, and you'll be left to mourn the loss. As I repeat, you know, when there is a need, and if you don't grab it, somebody else will, and then you'll be left to mourn the loss. It's not only the way that your practice points, but also the way you practice. I think that is the point. I'll just uh, give an example. In a cleft lip, when you're doing cleft lip and palate, when we are in training days in our 1980s, this is a conversation that was going on between three um, senior uh, heads of departments, and we are all standing like boys are standing. One said, my waiting list is one year. The other said, I can't even bother to find out the waiting list because it's too long. The other said, I have to retire in two years, and I got enough of cases for the next two years. So, but then, there's something wrong in this conversation. I felt that there's something wrong in this conversation because we seem to be taking pride in our inefficiency. That means we are not delivering goods. We seem to be taking pride in our inefficiency. But then that pride can't last long and it really didn't. You then enter the smile train. Okay, the smile train entered and then really shifted the way. It, certain centers in our country almost did about uh, 300 to 400 uh, clefts per month. It might say that you now we scaled up, but then there's nothing to be very great proud about. But it also inherently think, it also tells about the quality of the prevailing healthcare. Healthcare system, the service gap that existed in those places. So that means, you know, though we are plastic surgeons, we are just left it off, and then there's a, such a big gap that existed. So now, presently, if you take your, maximum, uh, your uh, participation in smile train cases, smile train, we do about you know, 40,000 cases per month, but then 8,000 cases are done by maxillofacial surgeons. And the other organization, ABMS, that's mostly against the maxillofacial, they do 2,500. So 20% of the cleft surgery, I think, is not done by plastic surgeons. I think one in five. And then we cannot be against this, and we should not be against it. Because if you say you are against it, that means there are people who say that you are too selfish, because the interest of the patient is supreme. And educating the next generation of plastic surgeons is least on the agenda of a mother with cleft lip and palate. I think what she wants is that she wants the deformity to be corrected, corrected well, and corrected at the earliest opportunity. She doesn't care in who does it. I think she only wants it to be corrected. I think we need to be aware of this fact, I think whenever we make decisions. See, while this has been the experience, I think what we need to do is to not merely look at what we are doing, I think what needs to be done, I think that's what we need to be looking at. My prediction is that the lessons learned, I think we started a project for hope after fire for uh, uh, burn deformities. See, this is a lady now who has not walked for two years. I think there have been uh, so many things that like that. And this is a boy who has got injured in his... Uh, uh, when he was a two-year-old, now, now he's you know, 20, 22 year old he's never worn a shirt in his life. He's, but then, he's not living in a forest, you know? he was living only 85 kilometers from Ganga Hospital. So that means they're not in a remote place, but then we are not, you know, we are not reached them. I think if we don't reach like this, I'm very sure in the future what will happen is a project may come for burnt contractors like Smiltry. And then we'll all up and about shout, and then because why we will shout is that they will not be necessarily be done by plastic surgeons. I think it will be done by, they will spread the net. And then I think that's the point you know, which we need to, need, need to understand. When I was the president of APSI, along with our secretary and um, Rakesh helped arrange this meeting with the then uh, uh, Union Health Minister, Gulam Nabi Azad. He gave us 10 minutes, but he spent one hour. You see me talking with the laptop as to say what we are doing. He said he was totally shocked. At the end of it, what I was trying to think was to make the plastic aid for him to announce something big for plastic We had a lot of other plans. But then he took the conversation the other way around. He said, you seem to be doing great things. 
He said, what, your, what has been your association doing all this long? That's the next question he asked. And uh, as a body of 1,500, it's impossible for you to reach out. Then he said, I've got a very great idea. Okay, he called his all secretaries and said, we, they found some funds. He said, if your association would help training surgeons in areas where there are no plastic surgeons for three, for three months, then government will fund the project. I thought and I was so worried to project the idea into APSA. I'm sure all of us will be extremely upset if, we, if this specialty comes. If this point comes. But that's the way, you know, uh, the, the mind of the administrator works. He doesn't care, you know, he, they only want it to reach. I think instead of they thinking about it, I think we need, we need to think about it. So we need to think that we are the problem for everything. If you have to so first own up the problem, I'm just telling you the same thing happens in the demography of countries, in the various specialties. So I just give an example. Bulgaria is a country of uh, uh, 71 lakhs. When they got into the EU, all the young fellows you know, migrated out of the country for better wages. But then they also, somebody needs to do the roads, somebody needs to clean the places. So a lot of other ethnic minorities came in. And the birth rate is 8.7 and the death rate is 8.7. It's a shrinking country. But then of the birth that is there, it is replaced by not by original Bulgarians, but the people who came in. And they predict by 2050, there'll be no original Bulgarians. So I think that's, that's the way it is there. So, uh, talking about this, uh, former vice chief of AR staff, he came to the hospital at that time, he was talking about this to him. He told me that you cannot do away with the person who does the 3D job. That is the dirty, difficult, dangerous set. He was telling me how at the end of the Second World War, a lot of people were brought into major areas, maybe big countries, to do the, build the bridges, build the dams and everything. But after building the bridges and the houses, he's not going to go away. Okay, so if you just leave off the difficult jobs, then you'll be. So we need to continue to take an active interest, which I consider it difficult. I think while we conquer new things, the problem is that now we should not leave off our acute burns, acute trauma, diabetic food, lymphedema, cancer. It's just not free flap, wholesome care. So if you're not going to do this, I think you now we will be losing out. If you just try to do things which are easy, then the competition level becomes higher. So you need to offer a product with the quality at a price you know, others can't match. So the chances of losing out in this competitive race with dermatologists and others is higher unless the quality gap or the price advantage is very high. I think which, you know, I'm sure which will be extremely difficult to match with the other specialties. So that means you know, our quality gap or the price advantage has to, be, has to be extraordinarily high. Then the next important thing is we need to team up with more specialties and we need to a paradigm shift in thought is the way we think about ourselves and we think about others. I think we think, you know, we are very great. I'll just give an example of you know, how others are doing and take up the maxillofacial association itself. At the time of their annual conference for the last three years, they hold an entrance exam. They got you know, two fellowships, one is in trauma, other is in uh, orthognathic. And they try to choose and then try to train them. The, uh, the association assessed the volume and the quality of work and found that the best training phase for maxillofacial trauma, they took one of us, I think they had chosen us. And this has been our statistics for our uh, maxillofacial uh, trauma. In the other central they chose for orthogonetic is triture. That is, they chose. And what they do is the candidate who scores the highest, that means the bright boy, is sent on a one-year fellowship and his stipend is paid by the association. You think we don't pay that. Then the stipend is paid by the association. So he's a bright person, he gets an overall exposure. In future, he'll become a leader. But then some people in our association, the response would be, oh, you should not train him. Suppose you say you will not train him, they'll send him to Changu. I think it's not that, no, no longer no, you can contain knowledge. I think no longer you can contain knowledge. I think we need, to, we need to understand. What we need to do is, I think we need to look in. Our association has to expose our best and the brightest to other specialties. I think if you want to we further go, then what we need to do is that we need to expose our people into the uh, other specialties. So next is we need to create institutions of value. I think John F. Kennedy in his own of his State of Union address, he said, we shall be judged more by what we do at home than what we preach abroad. I think it's very, very true. I just change the words. I say, we shall be judged more by what we do in our own hospitals every day than what we talk in Absicon. I think what we talk, I think this is very, very true. And Jamsaj, I go back to Tata's again. He said, Jamsaj, he said, if rhetoric could create wealth, then the roads of India will be paved with gold. I think that's what. Now we need to we need to go beyond you know, talking. So what we need to do is to create institutions of value because if you really find any institution you take, you know, they have a peak. 
and then they don't remain in the pig beyond 30 years and it becomes you know, extremely difficult. India needs them because if unless we have sustaining institutions of value because they allow the power of legacy and they allow the power of you know, pushing things forward. So the question is, how do you create institutions of value if you want to push our specialty forward? The founder, the immediate next, the third generation. And the surgical generation in India is about you know, only 15 years. Surgi I think all of us have to understand, surgical generation is not 30 years or 40 years. Surgical generation is 50 years. For example, me, between me and Hari or Bharati, it is 15 years. Between Hari and my son, it is 15 years. We don't have to worry about the next generation at all. It is just impossible for uh, the generations to catch up and then we need to keep going. The founder is usually driven by passion, is self-propelled, and then they get things done no matter what it takes. Sometimes they may use bad methods, good methods, and then no matter what it takes, they get things done. But then usually they say they are, some of the founders have uh, got the problem, they worry about the competition, but then because they don't have, they nurture the second generation, they go down. So they have already asked uh, Hewlett Packard CEO, well, when do you start looking out for your successor? He said, oh, I started the process the day I took over. I think that's the way we do. I think that's the way we, we, we ought, to be, ought to be doing and we, we nurture our second generation. The problem with the generation next is that is the problem of you know, who is superior, who is there. They said the trouble with equality is that one always claims it with superiors. I think what the second generation must have if you want to build up, uh, build up the units is the obsession of the founder. The only one quality they need to have is the obsession of the founder. Nine days ago, this uh, Jeff Bezos gave this... Uh, interview in Seattle, which really created ripples. It's just only nine days, it's current. He said, now one day Amazon will go bankrupt. He just suddenly said, Amazon will go bankrupt. Okay, all strict up. Now Amazon is raising high. I think it's soaring very high. At this time, he said, go. And then he said, now what is that? He said to all his employees in the next world people, he said, the key to, the key to prolonging the demise continuity is for the company to obsess with the customers and to look inward. And he said, if you start focusing on ourselves, instead of focusing on customers, there will be, there'll be beginning of the end. I think the best advice that I can give the second generation is that now you have to be obsessed with patient care. You don't have to worry about anything. You in your hospital, in your this thing. You, if you get obsessed with patient care, you, your unit, the specialty will automatically grow. I think the best advice I ever got in, from my old client is this. If you love hand surgery and keep on doing good hand surgery, I think there are two adjectives in these words. And then everything will take care of itself, and then everything takes care of itself, I'm sure about it. So nurturing leadership, I think that's we, you know. See, not all are said to be leaders, but then what I really like to do is that all of us must work to our, work to our full, fit and full potential. The next is, if we have to make our specialty grow in our country, I think we need to go global. See, it must not be mere rhetoric, it must not be mere talking about so what we need to do is that we need to become members of international organizations. Because the first question is how it is going to benefit me, is the question. But what we need to do, you have to become members and then get the benefit. You can't, you know, thinking about, you know, thinking about it in the, the other way around. So affordability is not a question, I think it's only a question of mindset. You take the January business standard, even right now, India is the country which spends the most on outbound travel. The fastest growth is obtained from India. And we grew from 8 million tourists to 50 million tourists. In the, in the last two years, the spending by Indians in foreign travel is 370% increase. This is not on business travel, it's on holiday travel. So that means you know, we are a country now which we can afford. But then, when it comes to professionals, we can't do. For example, in the next week we are going into ISBI we are having. The total ratio is around 6.30, only 10% is Indians. When you have an international conference in India, so you can't say you can't afford. I think now it's only a question of now mindset. What we need to do, I don't want it to be 50%, at least it has to be 20%. Even you take it away, when a meeting happens in Korea, Japan, and even Asian countries, you'll find that the number of people participants from that area is 40% to 50%. Okay, but then we are only 10%. I think that, that, that has to really change. Because unless we take it on ourselves, instead of blaming on others. When I was a schoolboy, the ex company, they used to be a nice ad, they used to be running. But at the end of it, they'll write a small line. He said, you cannot remold a country without a little mud on your hands. So unless you know, we start doing something ourselves, you know, we not worry about what others do, I think what others do. And linking with other international bodies, that again is very important. I think visionary leadership is the leader. I think his time is up, I'll just go fast. So I think unless you know, we get on to the, uh, we have to link up with other international bodies. 
When we start that process, we always think, oh, what do we get? I think we can't be thinking of what do we get. Well, for this, I'll give a great example that we had recently. We, had, we have a founder's oration. We invite extraordinarily big people to come to our hospital. We invited the chairman of Tata Steel, Muthuraman. He said, now we shamelessly went everywhere to learn. And he said, at a time when Tata Steel was not making profit, the management boldly decided to send top executives to a leadership training program in France, the fee for which was one crore. I think he said I was a member of it. So how did it pay rich dividends? It paid a rich dividends. They, when they came back and they said they will make the Tatas the most quality efficient place in the country. And they had this, they, they put this vision at a time when Tata Steel was not even the best in, the whole, in India. At the time they said, okay, we'll make a process you know, which will make the, the topmost in the country. So where is the specialty? Again, the last point is that we need to attract no talent. I think we must become the top choice of the best and the brightest. And for this, if they, for the young fellow has got a choice, I think the choice that makes is almost that the economic issues will drive decisions. So that means you now we need to sell the specialty. We need to sell ourselves and sell the specialty so that the best and the brightest takes. I think that means you, know, you need a strong advocacy. I think you need a strong body for publicity storm. It needs a long-time strategy. I have to tell you, I am very convinced about it. It just doesn't come with good website. It just come, doesn't come with frequent Facebook posting and WhatsApp posting of the good cases that you do. I think it just doesn't come like that. I think well, we need to invest time and money. And being a cynical doesn't help. I think we need, we need to really try. See, with such an amount of varied things that we can do, something head to foot we can do, the scope of the specialty being so wide and the need so high in the community, it has to become the first choice of the best and the brightest. I think only then we can, I think, you know, we can make the specialty go to the correct speed. So what we really need are no champions. I think we need a champion in every field. We need a champion in microsurgery. We need a champion in cleft. We need a champion. And then they need to become the face of the specialty. And that the nurture, leadership has to be nurtured. And then all of us have to work to our full potential. I think that's the, that's the mantra. All of us have to work to our full potential. When each of us do that, I think what will happen, you will become what you should be. And the plastic surgery in India will reach the stature where it ought to be. And I'm sure in India that could be. Thank you so much.